Let's start off with that latter hat, mm -hmm. first of all. Good morning. Good morning, Guy. Um, British industry's got a lot to think about Indeed. at the moment. Let's deal with what's been happening at least over the last few days. Theresa May has laid out her plans for how EU nationals will be treated in the United Kingdom after Brexit takes place and their rights uh, that they're mm -hmm. going to enjoy or not enjoy yep. in Britain. You are an industry that employs a lot of people from around the world. You bring in smart people and you employ them in mm -hmm. the UK chemical sector. What do you make of what Theresa May is saying? Well, I think it's, there's still a lot of confusion. I think that's the big problem. And uh, I think business has been saying from the start that what we need is clarity, and we're still waiting for that clarity. If you look at chemicals, uh, our actual EU uh, proportion is actually quite small overall. It's about 5%. But if you look at the, the key technical roles, it jumps up to about 20%. Right. So shop floor is pretty well all UK, but the technical skilled yep. areas very high. And that's where we've always had no borders. I mean, we move people around in the scientific and technical and management areas as if there were no borders. And we need to continue to do that uh, because we need to get the best people. And I don't think we've yet got the clarity as to how easily we can do that. If it becomes too bureaucratic, that's a barrier. And we can do without that barrier. Any sense at this point in time that you're already struggling? Are people saying, I don't want to come and work for you in the UK because I don't know what my position is ultimately going to be. We, we've not seen that yet. We, uh, those conversations have undoubtedly they started on June the 24th last yeah. year. People started to get very nervous. I think they've relaxed a bit since then and they've been waiting for these announcements. Whether what we've seen so far will reassure them or not, I don't know. We haven't yet had a situation where someone said, you know what, I'm not coming. But I can see that around the corner unless we get absolute clarity. What does it mean in terms of, in terms of product? And what your plans are there, both at the Ineos and, and within the sector more widely? I think the biggest issue for the chemical sector uh, is the fact that we have very complex supply chains, which have always ignored the border between the UK and the EU27. Yeah. So you might have a molecule that starts in Belgium, moves to the UK, processes something else, moves back to Germany, gets reprocessed, and then gets shipped back to the UK as a final product. That's quite common in our industry. If we have tariff borders, that's not one tariff barrier, that's four, as it crosses the border yeah. constantly. And that's the big problem. So what are, you, what are your plans? What, what is the industry doing to plan, to prepare, to get ready for I, I, In reality, what the industry is doing is it's looking at those supply chains and looking at the contingency plan that says, worst case, if we had to restructure that, we would. That would actually have a big impact, both in the UK and abroad, because we would actually close facilities to avoid those cross-border movements. And that would be bad news for both economies. From an Ineos point of view, are you positioning yourself? Are you starting to get ready? Are those contingency plans in place? Well, we, we, from an Ineos point of view, our biggest contingency planning has been around getting our cost base right in the UK, and that's been about getting low-cost feedstocks in, which we've done from the US now. So we've given ourselves, we believe, a pretty strong insurance policy to cover the vagaries of Brexit. Ineos is, is a company that's, that's thinking carefully about what it wants to do and how it does it. How broad is... Jim Radcliffe... The, Obviously, is thinking fairly broadly, but I'm, I'm curious to know, kind of internally, how broadly you are thinking. Are you listening, looking at adjacent sectors, thinking, yeah, we, we'll have a bit of that? Kind of how 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 far does the thinking going in terms of how far? Because you're in full expansion mode, right? No, we are absolutely. No, uh, we've always had, uh, with one exception, which I'll come to in a minute. We've always had a view that says we we move up or down our chain. So we've yep. we've been fundamentally a petrochemicals company. Yep. We've now moved upstream into oil and gas, uh, and that's our big expansion area at the moment. That will continue. Um, but apart, and, and we very rarely move downstream. We actually did move a little bit downstream in the US this year. We bought a pipe maker, a plastic right. pipe maker. Okay. But that's unusual for us. And it just happened to be a good business and it worked for us. But we don't tend to move too far downstream. So it's extending our range logically and organically. The only exception to that is the project we have in the automotive sector at the moment, which is yeah. slightly sort of left field for us. Yeah. It'd be nice to see what this... this Quasi Land Rover ultimately looks like. We'll come back and maybe talk about that in a moment. Absolutely. But when, when it's been done in the past, there's been a debt issue associated with mm -hmm. the expansion. How, yeah. Are you thinking differently this time about how you're kind of structuring it from a financial point of view? Well, the world is very different, of course. You know, we, we, we grew, our big growth phase was in, in the noughties through, uh, in the days when you could leverage very yeah. highly. Uh, we used to have a very simple process. We would lever up to about five times EBITDA, work that down to two or three, and then lever yeah, back up. Yeah. And, and that was our sawtooth approach on debt. You know, the world has moved on, but we've moved on significantly. I mean, you know, our, 
uh, our EBITDA now is over four billion dollars a year. Yep. Um, so you know we and our debt is falling. I mean we actually repaid about a billion of debt last year, um, which is very unusual for us. We yep. don't really keep our debt levels reasonably high. Um, so we're in a very different market. We can fund a huge amount of our expansion internally from our own cash reserves. Um, but our um, our reputation in the debt market, I think, is good. So when we do need to go out and borrow, we can. But our leverage ratios now are extremely low. Um, so we've got lots of capacity. There's firepower there, ready lots to go. Of firepower. Are you ready to? Are you getting ready to kind of? Is there something big coming? Um, we're opportunists. You know, we we see what's out there and yeah. we do good deals and we don't pay too much. <laughs> that sounds like a that sounds like a very nice business model. Um, let's talk about the North Sea. What are the opportunities in the North Sea? Um, Pipelines obviously are an issue. Are we coming down to sort of single pipelines? What's happening with with decommissioning? Is there an sure. opportunity for kind of roll up there? Is there kind of in, like in private equity sort of roll up business and everything gets kind of rolled together and that provides an opportunity as well? Kind of yep. where where do you see the opportunities in the North Sea? Uh, we we see the North Sea uh, uh, as a, in the same position as the petrochemical industry was 20 years ago when we started to grow, uh, which was ownership with a lot of companies who didn't want to be there. Absolutely. Um, and, and we saw that as our opportunity because what we are is very good asset managers. We, we manage the detail on these assets. And ultimately, North Sea platforms, etc., are chemical plants at sea, yep. uh, ultimately. And we think we can bring a lot to that party because we are, we think, good asset managers. So we can manage the costs, we can manage the efficiencies, we can manage everything, in, which is all about maximising ec economic returns. There's still a lot of oil and gas down there. The UK needs that oil and gas, and we think we can do a good the, job extracting The decommissioning is an issue because ultimately, it kind sure. of, if a company has a problem, it rolls back. Yeah, yeah. And, and therefore, companies get very nervous about kind of how their assets are, are sold and they're, who they're sold to. Correct. Does that work in your favour in terms of, I, of, because people know you and understand Jim's business and, yeah. and, and under, uh, uh, sort of seen him do, do this in the past? It's, it's, it, it, I think it swings and roundabouts. The, the negative here is it makes valuation of businesses extraordinarily difficult because of the, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the decommissioning is hanging out there as a cost, but it also is out there as a credit because you have, through the taxation system, quite a lot of credit that's associated yep. with that over time. And how you transfer that across and how you value that is probably the biggest challenge we face when we're looking at businesses in the North Sea.